term. Good. So for this class, we look we look at options and we look at working capital management. We look at them in a rather rudimentary um, manner, though. So for options, it's just going to be you're just going to understand when it makes sense to exercise an option and when it doesn't. I will not go into any detail about constructing uh, like a portfolio with options. Um, none of that. I will not go into the valuation of options, none of that. Working capital, we'll just touch on some of the things that you can do um, so that you can manage working capital a little more efficient. All right, so it's pretty straightforward aspect of, of option, the very rudimentary aspect of it, right? So just to repeat for the test, it's all the lectures from lecture one to lecture nine. But it would, again, it would be nothing that you haven't seen before. Good. So a couple of terminology that you should be comfortable with. So there are derivatives, which is any financial instrument that is derived from another. So for example, you have options, warrants, futures, swaps, those are derivatives, financial derivatives. Then you have options which give the holder the right to buy or sell a security at a specified price during a specified period of time. In the case of an American option, but in the case of a European option, then it gives you that right to buy or sell a security at a specified price at a specified time. So that's one critical difference between an American option and a European option. So an American option, let's say you buy the option today um, and you, so in the case of American option, you buy it today at February what? February 4th, uh, then you have, let's say it is a three months option. You have three months during that period which you can exercise the option in the case of an American option. In the case of a European option, if you buy a three months option today, then you could only exercise that option uh, three months from today on that day, um, for example, or if it's a six months on the day of the six month, or if it's a year or nine months on the day of the nine months, right? So just to go that again, American option gives you the right to exercise or, or to execute that transaction during a period. A European option gives you the right to transact that particular transaction. Uh, business at a particular date. Then there, there are call options, which is the right to buy a security at a specified price within a specified time. All right, so you buy a call option and then you have a right to purchase a particular security or share at a particular price during a particular time or at a particular time. Then there is the put option, which is the right to sell a security at a specified price within a specified time. Then there's the option premium. That's a price paid for the option above the price of the underlying security. Right. Uh, more terminology, there's the intrinsic value, which is a difference between the strike price and the stock price. So the strike price or the exercise price is the price that you will uh, buy that right for and then the stock price is that market price at that particular date when you will transact that business. So the difference between those two prices is the intrinsic value. Then there's a time premium, which is the value of an option above the intrinsic value. There's an exercise price or what we call a strike price. That's a price at which you buy or sell the security. There's an expiration date. That's the last date on which the option could be exercised. So for example, if you have a three months option, uh, you bought it today and it expires on, let's say the 4th of May, um, three months from now, then the ex expiration date would be 4th of May. Right? And as I explained just now, an American option is an option that can be exercised at any time prior to, or including the expiration date, while a European option can only be exercised on a specified expiration date. Right, so those are a couple of terminologies that you should be off with so that whenever you hear um, 
like exercise price, intrinsic value, have an idea of what they're speaking of about when they're talking about options. This is a table of uh, how options are quoted. So in this table, we are looking at puts and calls for Amazon. So the way we read this is you have the maturity date on the left column. Then you have the exercise price in the next column, the price of a call option in the third column, and then finally the price of a put option. So you will say, for example, that you can purchase a call option for $95.58. So you purchase a call option, which gives you the right to buy a share in July 2017 at $820. So you'll pay $95.58 to purchase, which gives you the right to purchase the Amazon share at $820, right? So that's in a call option. If we, go down, if we go down a little lower, you can also pay $14.08, which gives you the right to purchase an Amazon share for $9.80, right? And we can go down even farther into October. You can pay, for example, $113.30, which gives you the right to purchase an Amazon shares in October for $820. On the other side, you can pay $14.40, which gives you the right to sell an Amazon share for $820. So whenever you purchase a put option, it gives you the right to sell at a particular price. So for example, if you pay, you can pay $63.63 to purchase a right to sell an Amazon share for $940, right? So that's how you read the table. So generally to say the value of a call option reduces as the exercise price goes up. So we see that the exercise price going up, the value of the call option goes down, right? And then you say the longer decision period to exercise the option or not, the more valuable it is. So for example, for the same exercise price of 820 in July, you'll pay $95.58. But as you look at three months late in October, you pay $113.30 for the same exercise price. And if you look part of three months more into January, you pay 128 23 for the same exercise price. The reason why this happened is that because of the thing is that the more time you have, the likelihood of the, of the price going up, so the actual sheer price going up would be greater than, than what you have in here, right? So the, the, the whole thinking is behind it because thinking behind it is that time is on your side and the possibility of you having a higher strike price or the actual, the actual uh, share price being above this is greater, right? So that's why the longer you, you, you take, um, the longer position you take on a particular share by buying a call, it will cost you more. Any questions? Sir, can you explain, explain the call option one more time and the put option? So the call option gives you the right to purchase a share at a particular price. So for example, you can pay $64.30, right? Which gives you the right to purchase a share in Amazon for $900, right? So you'll make a deposit or you take a position with, a, with an option trader and say, look, I think that I will make this deposit of $64.30 to lock in the price of an Amazon share at $900, right? So that's on the call option, on the call side. On the put side, you can go to also go to an option trader and say, look, I'm gonna pay you now to get to have the right to sell. So I'll pay you $55.60 
which gives me the right to sell on Amazon shares um, in this particular time period for $860. So, right, so when you buy a call, it's the right to purchase at a particular price during a particular period. When you buy a put, is the right to sell a particular share at a particular price during a particular period, right? So remember, call, purchase, put, sell. So is in, that clear? Clearer? So in no case, do you actually have? Do you actually purchase the shares? You're just either buying right. the right to sell or you're buying the right to purchase. Right. That's correct. So you're not so you're just buying the option to. The decision to actually purchase the share would be would 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 uh would be determined when that particular maturity date reaches. Then you'll decide. Or anytime during in the case of American option, anytime during that three or six months or nine months you've purchased that right, you can decide whether or not to cash in. So for instance, if it's a call option and Amazon price, the market price of the share goes up to $1,000. Then because you've purchased that right, let's say of at $42.80 to buy the shares at $900. If the price of the share goes up to $1,000, then you more, more than like, any rational person will more than likely buy the share, exercise the option and buy the share for $900 instead of going on the market and buy it for $1,000. So that's when it makes sense, right? On the other side now, if let's say the, you purchase a put option, so you purchase a put option, uh, let's say at $63.63, .63, and that gives you the right to sell the Amazon share at 940. Well, let's say for instance, during the period, then the price went down to, let's say 920, then it will make sense for you to, not selling the open market for 920, but to exercise your option and sell it for 940. But if the share price, let's say, went up to um, $1,000, then it wouldn't make sense for you to exercise that put option and sell for 940. So you'll just let your deposit slide, and then you will sell um, sell the option on the well, sell a stock on the open market then for $1,000, because then you'll get more. Um, in the open market than if you would have um, exercised that option. It takes some getting used to, so you'll have, you, you probably have to read it again. Good. So let's work through an example. And this is, this is a call option. So let's assume you bought a January 18 call option with an exercise, exercise price of 940, you paid, $62.58 for the option. So if we go back to the table, $62.58, you paid up for a call option to sell the Amazon stock at 940, right? Three things can happen. The share price can be above, below, or equal to the exercise price, right? And the exercise price is 940. If the share price at the end of the period is above the exercise price, the call option has value because you're paying less for the current market value of the share. So if the share price goes up to $1,000, you're in fact are only paying 940 for the particular share, right? So it has value. If the share price at the end of the period is below the exercise price, then the call option is worthless because no rational person will pay higher for your share that you can go to the market and purchase for less, right? So if the share price goes to $900, then you don't exercise the option. You just let your deposit go and you go to the market and you buy that share for $900 if you really want it, right? Questions, comments? Is that clear? So how you just know the, the market price is being known to you at the time when you purchase? Right. No, you wouldn't know the market price. But what you know is that you're locking in a particular price, which we call the exercise price, right? 
when you are ready to trans, remember the market price would, would um, move based on different factors, um, the performance of the company, maybe the company would have um, invested, recently invested in a, in, a, in a new, in a bit of project with a significant MPV. So then you know, the price will go up. Uh, maybe they had just discovered new technology or commercialized new technology. Maybe they would have had a significant hire, right? So remember the market response to all of these things and that will drive the market price. So you would not, you would not know what is the market price until um, you know, things materialize during the period. And then you can decide whether or not you want to exercise the option now or whenever you want to exercise the option, right? But when you take out, a, when you take out, a, when you purchase an option, it's somewhat you hedging your position, saying, well, I think if you purchase a call option, you're saying, well, look, I think that, um, you know, the price, this is what the price is going to be in three months time, right? Or six months time or nine months time. Right. And if the price, if the share price at the end of the period is above, then well, then you would have benefited because now you're paying less than um, what you would have paid in the open market. Right. So it's a bet you're taking. So remember, we're not, we, will, we wouldn't know the market price beforehand because the market is very dynamic. Right. Any more questions? So on the other side for put option, so let's assume that you bought the January 18 put option with an exercise price of 860. You paid $55.60 for the option. Again, three things could happen. The share price can be above, below, or equal to the exercise price. If the share price at the end of the period is above the exercise price, then the put option is worth this, right? Because any rational person would would exercise the put option, would not exercise the put option for 860. If it could be sold for $900, for say $900 in the open market. So this should be would not. So if you bought the put option, so that's an option to sell Amazon shares at 860, but then the market price is 900, then you wouldn't sell at $40. Well, at least any rational person wouldn't sell that share at $40 less. You will just forego the, for want of a better word, the deposit or the right that you bought and sell on the open market for the $900, right? Because then you'll be making $40 more on each share. On the other hand, if the share price at the end of the period is below the exercise price, the put, option has value because of, instead of obtaining the market value of, of say 930, you can exercise the price of 860, right? So in the second scenario, if the share price at the end of the period is below the exercise price, so now you're saying it's 830, so the market value of the share is now 830, but you've bought that right to sell the share at 860, then you'll go ahead and sell at 860 instead of going to the market and selling at 830. Because if you sell at 830, then you'll be losing $30 on each share. Questions? Are there any questions? All right, so this is the very basic of calls and puts. This just sums up an example. So if you have an option exercise stock price, so you have an option to exercise a stock price get greater than $900. In this example, then the payoff would be the stock price. So you've taken a position um, and you've purchased a, an option and the exercise price is $900, right? So if the stock price is greater than 900, then you'll go for the stock price, right? And then the option payoff would be the stock price 
minus, and that's a market stock price minus the $900, which was the option you bought. And the extra payoff for holding the stock instead of the option would be $900, right? If the option ex exercise on exercise, so that's a stock price less than the $900 that you would have paid for, then the payoff, stock payoff remains a stock price. So whatever is open in the market, but then you don't exercise the option. You just allow the, the option to go. So it will have zero payoff. And the extra payoff from holding the stock instead of the option would be the stock price. So that just summarizes what we, what we um, looked at in the two previous examples. And it tells you exactly what the payoff will be, uh, what the option payoff would be, and what the extra payoff from holding the stock instead of the options would be. A couple of things to note, and these are conceptual things. So it says, if there's an increase in the stock price, the change in the call option price would be positive. So if the stock price goes up, then the, the money you pay for the call option would also increase, right? So if the stock price goes up by $5, uh, the call option price will go up by, by some amount too, right? Secondly, if there's an increase in the exercise price, right? Then the change in the, uh, the call option price would be negative. So the price will go down. So the amount of money you pay to obtain an option will reduce. In all other situations, if there's an increase in the interest rate, and this is the risk-free interest rate. If there's an increased um, time to expiration, uh, expiration, so instead of uh, three months, you go to six months. And they also, if there's, an, if there's increased volatility in the stock price, all of that will result in an increase in the call option price. Particularly the last one, where there's increased volatility in the stock, so it, it fluctuates up, down, right? Uh, the reason why the call option would increase is because the reasoning is that increased volatility has the, well, the position, the situation might, re, uh, might realize where the stock price will actually um, get higher, right? So that's why they will increase the call option price. Other properties of a call option, the upper bung, that's the option price, is always a less than the stock price. The lower bung, the call price never falls below the payoff to immediate stock price. So the price minus the, the stock price minus the exercise price of zero, which one ever is, is larger. So in, the, in terms of the upper bung, if you wouldn't make a profit from having the, uh, the option, then you will just allow the the option to uh, go on exercise. So then you only lose the deposit that you would have made, right? If the stock is worthless, then the call is worthless. Um, as the stock price becomes very large, the call price approaches the stock price less the present value of the exercise price, right? Well, these are concepts that you just have to know by heart. I wouldn't ask you to um, do any calculations based on that. All right, any questions? So these are just concepts you should know. Those who go on to do um, higher level finance, then doing calculations based on these concepts would be your headache then. Any yeah, questions? Was there a question? All right, good. So, this example now, as I told you just now about the value of volatility. So you're asked which package of executive stock options would you choose? So you have an example here, two companies, they offer essentially the same executive stock option as, as payment, but the only difference is in the stock price volatility, so the standard deviation of the returns. So under the establishment industry, it's 24% stock volatility. 
while on the digital organics, it's 36% um, stock vol volatility. And because of the higher volatility, then the option that is given to you on the digital organics will have more value simply because it presents to you uh, more chances of have, having a, a significant upside than the other, in, uh, other company establishment industry. So you'll see that they have the same number of options, the same exercise price, uh, the maturity same years, so the duration the same years, uh, current stock price is the same, but here it's the volatility of the returns that is, is a standout factor. And when we look at options, because the volatility, because more volatility presents a better opportunity of an upside in a, in a, in a particular stock, then that is valued more. And hence digital organic would be the option with the greater value. All right. Good. So questions? All right. So we go to real options and real options. So the options that we just discussed were more uh, financial instruments. So you can actually go to the market and purchase these options. Real options are options that are built into business cases. So for instance, when we look at NPV calculations, we just look at the project as um, very fixed. So we looked at it as a 10 year uh, calculation. We looked at it as an investment in a particular machinery or warehouse or whatever it was. And we didn't look at you know, um, the other options that are normally available in life. So it was just one scenario we looked at. But now we look at what are some of the real options uh, that are built in to investments. So there are four broad real options. So there's an option to expand. So if the investment succeeds, so for instance, demand is outstripping uh, your, your, your capacity that you have, then the sensible thing to do once you have the available finances is to expand. Okay? Then there's the option to wait and learn before investing. I think in lecture five, we looked at an example where a company had a login concession, I think it was, and they have done some calculations and they recognized that if they had waited until year two, I think, to start the investment, then it would have derived a higher net present value. So that's another real option that is available to managers, companies, so that wait and learn before you invest, right? So not necessarily always being the first mover, but sometimes the second mover, especially with new technologies, uh, we stand a better chance, right? So there's also significant li literature around uh, second movers. Right? Then there's the option to reduce an investment or completely abandon it. Right? So you might have done your estimates and then you found that as the business started, uh, one demand wasn't meet meeting up. So then you decide that you can shrink the operations, maybe allot it to another uh, business line, or then if it's not profitable at all, then you can also totally abandon the project, right? And then there's the option to vary the mix of output or the firm's production methods. So for instance, uh, you can build, you can have built into your production line some amount of flexibility. So for instance, you can have one production line producing more than one um, output so that if the, and then you can use that particular production line based on the demand of whichever uh, output is greater, All right? So that's one way of doing it. And then there's the option of, um, or the form just using different production methods to produce one particular output, right? So there's one production method that can produce more than one output, or there can be several production methods producing one output, right? 
So based on the economics and the given day, then you can, or given period, then you can decide uh, what is the best uh, output mix to, to derive or to pursue, sorry. So the value of a real option is the MPV with the option minus the MPV without the option, All right? Questions? Are there any questions? So I'll share with, I wouldn't share with you uh, the more challenging ones of real options to expand, uh, I think very, but I can share with you one uh, that you can look at the timing options, which is, which is synonymous with the wait and learn, right? So here, the possible cash flows and, and the period values for a malted herring project are shown below. So you can start, you can invest 200,000 cash flows could be, if you have high demand, sorry, if you have the high demand, uh, cash flows will be 25 and it will be valued at 250, all right, that project. If it is low demand, cash flows is only be 16 and the project would be valued at 60. So, right, so with this valuation, You will have with the project value of 250 and the MPV being, um, and then you have investments of 80, then the value of this, the MPV would be 70. On the other hand, well, sorry, the option would be 70, sorry. And then on the other hand, uh, because it doesn't, it's not more than what you've invested of, of 200,000, 200, then the actual value here would be zero, right? So if you wait, if you wait for the demand to be significant, then you'll have cash flow of 25, the value will be 250. If on the other hand, uh, the demand is low, then the value after one year would be 160, right? If we look at this, so we, if, how do we value the options? So, as I said just now, high demand generates 25 million and a value of 250 million at the end of the year. Low demand generates 16 million and no value. So if in a high demand situation, the total return would be the two, would be the cash flow generated plus the, the value of 250 upon the initial investment minus one, and you'll have a return of 37.5%. In a low demand situation, you'll have cash flow 16, value of, of 160, all upon an investment of 200 minus one. So you have a return of minus 12%. You're saying in a, re, a re, mutual return is 5%. So this is given, right? So if you've done the calculation to see what the return would be, if it is a high demand situation. You've done the calculation, see what the, uh, the return will be in a low demand situation. So how do you value the options? So the next step requires a calculation of probability that there is a high demand for a malted herring. So we're given that the risk neutral return is 5%. So the risk, so the expected return will be 5% probability of a high return times the, uh, the expected return on when if it's high demand. So that's 0.375 plus one minus the probability of a high demand times the return of minus 12%. And if we work that out, then the probability of a high demand would be 34, well, 0.3, 4, Free, right? So that would be the probability of a high demand if we undertake the project. And we've calculated that based on the expected return, which we say is equal to the probability of a high of a, of a, uh, probability of a high demand times the expected return plus the one minus the probability of high demand times the expected return in a low in a low demand situation. 
So it's the expected return here is equal to the probability of a high demand times the return plus one minus the probability of a high demand times the return in a low demand situation. So it's low demand situation here, high demand situation here. And then the problem. So we, once you work that out, the probability of a high demand would be 0.345. So you can insert these, you can do the math and you end up with 0.343. So the way you value the option now is to determine as follows. So the option value would be the probability of a high demand times 70. And you get that 70 from this figure here. And then times the probability, well, this is the probability of the low demand times whatever the return was. And you have the value of the option would be $22.9 uh, $22 million. So that's how you value the option if you wait um, until demand turns high. Right? That's one way of valuing the options of wait and, and learn. Any questions? Don't worry, these are just examples for you to see. I don't, you wouldn't come across these in the test. So no, no, no need to worry. So if you look at another option of abandonment, so we say, suppose uh, the crusher project can be abandoned with a recovery of 5.2 million from the sale of machinery and real estate. We can validate the abandonment option as a put, right? So if we abandon the project, we can sell it for 5.2 million. And remember a put option deals with the sale of an obligation or, or, or it gives you the right to sell, sorry. Then you also assume put last one year only and the one year standard deviation of the crush is 30%. Uh, Risk-free interest rate is 4%. The asset value is 4.8 million and the exercise price is 5.2 million. So all these facts are shared with you. So the call value, right? would be 49.49 million. And that comes from the B formula. So that's, one minute this. So we've used the, 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 what you call it, the Black and Scholes formula to arrive at this 0.49 million, but I will not go through the formula. It's a little long-winded and I, and I don't intend to teach the valuation of options, right? Well, how you calculate um, the black Scholes formula, but you'll just take this as a given so if we use that black Scholes formula, we'll end up with 490,000. The value of a put is equal to the call value plus the present value of the exercise price minus the asset value, which is called put call parity. Right. But you wouldn't go in, into that. But if we, if we work through it still, uh, it will be 0.49 million plus the present value of the exercise price, which would be 5.2 million divided by 1.04, because we're told that 4% was the right, interest free risk, the risk free interest rate minus the book value of the asset, and that will give you 690,000. So the actual value of the project would be the book value plus the 690 that we've worked out for the put option. So instead of abandoning, so you have two options you can abandon at 5.2 million or the project is actually worth 5.49 million, which is the 4.8 book value 
plus the the value we've put to the put option of 690,000. But it's just an example of how it, it would look. Um, as I said, I didn't go into teaching you how to use the Black-Scholes formula. Right? So these are just examples to, to, for you to see how it, how it looks and how the comparisons are made. Right? Any questions? And I repeat, you wouldn't see them in the exams. Any questions? All right. If none, so but there are some practical challenges um, that you will have with real options and why they're not always uh, feasible to use. So one, valuation of real options can be complex. And sometimes it's impossible to arrive at the perfect answer. Right. So imagine uh, you undertaking a project which has the potential to uh, expand, then capturing all the incidental costs and revenues from that could come from expansion could prove uh, very challenging, right? So that's why getting the perfect answer to that would be a challenge. Then real options do not always have a clear structure for their path and cash flows, right? A lot of things could be clouded. Uh, so arriving at what the real options, what your real options are um, in terms of structure. And again, where the cash will come from and where they will go becomes challenging. And then finally, when we look at real options, they do not always uh, include in the calculations the actions that competitors will take. So when we did discounted cash flows, it was always inward looking. Uh, so we looked at the cash flows that we would get, from the sales we made, the cash flows that we would incur whenever we made, made investments, but we never included in, in our discounted cash flow analysis the actions of our competitors and how those actions could impact our um, calculations at that point. Right. So that's also not a practical challenge. Questions, comments? All right. So you can take 10 minutes break. So we will start back at, uh, that'd be 18 past the hour.
Okay, so let's restart. Let's restart. All right, so we look at just a quick example. And it says Pintail stock price is currently $200. A one-year American call option has an exercise price of 50 and is priced at $75. How would you take advantage of this great opportunity? So the one-year American call option has an exercise price of 50 and it's priced at $75. So you'll pay $75 for the call option. The exercise price is 50. How would you take advantage of this great opportunity given that the stock price is currently $200? Where we do that is to So we go so you buy the American call for $75, so you buy the option to purchase the share for $50. Then you exercise the call immediately. So you buy the share for $50. And then having purchased the share for $50, then you sell it on the open market for $200. So then the gain that you end up with, so you sell for $200, you would have paid $75 for the right to sell that share for $50. Sorry, to buy that share. And then you buy that share at $50. So you pay $75 for the call. Having gotten that call, which is the right to purchase the share for $50, you purchase the share for $50 and then you on the open market, you sell it for $200. So in that case, you end up with a profit of $75. So in that way, that's when, it, when this particular call option makes sense for you, All right? Any questions? Is there any questions on this? No, sir. Right. Okay, great. Let's stop here. Let's go back to the... right. So in this second part, we look at working capital management. So first we look at invent. So if you recall working capital uh, is made up of current assets minus current liabilities, right? So in the management of working capital, we can break it down into its constituent parts and then manage them individually, or we can look at them as a whole, uh, like look at the assets alone. We can look at liabilities alone. We can look at them together. Ideally looking at them together as an entire pool is, is, is the right thing to do because then you don't lose sight of um, any particular class of, or any particular constituents. So just to recall, inventories are made up of raw materials, work in progress, finished goods. And for every category of inventory, there can be management techniques that you can apply. So for instance, um, with raw materials, in the management of them, you can ensure that uh, there's correct storage. You don't store too much. You don't store too little. Um, uh, there are some goods that require special storage conditions. So it might be temperature control. So you ensure those things happen. For work in progress, uh, you have to ensure that that work in progress in, in some cases is, is minimized. And even in some industries, work in progress is not something that you could, uh, that should even be in place. So for instance, uh, in the alcohol making industry, or at least that's what I've been told, if for instance, they have an outage, whatever is in that stiller, then goes a spoilage. So there's never really work in progress uh, for alcohol. And of course, so finished goods, you wanna ensure that you don't have, um, you don't overstock. 
because space might be of a premium, right? So the goal in, in inventory management uh, is to always ensure that you minimize the amount of cash that is tied up in inventory. Uh, and in so doing, you want to ensure you want to ensure too that you don't have things that such as stockouts, because stockouts also carry a cost. If you have too much inventory, then you also carry things like, uh, you know, in in addition to your cash being tied up, then you also have uh, things such as holding costs. Uh, some companies might be leasing warehouse facilities, so they incur you know those costs. One of the tools used to minimize inventory is the classical uh, approach used by the Japanese, which is just in time. Uh, so essentially they, they have arrangements with their suppliers uh, who will deliver those raw materials or inventory as they need. Um, so they, it, it allows them to reduce their carrying costs, um, re reduce the costs for storage and so forth. Uh, one of the practical ways in which this just-in-time works, I think Walmart has a system with their suppliers. So their, their suppliers uh, are also logged into their in inventory system. So Walmart would beforehand set up like minimum quantities. And once those values are reached or those amounts are reached, then it automatically triggers uh, like, like, a, like an order to the supplier so then the supplier will supply to whichever store so it's a kind of integrated network between walmart and some of its suppliers which helps to reduce uh you know their inventory costs uh, and the invent well the inventory carrying costs right and even to reduce uh, costs of stockouts right a couple of things that you you would um, note in terms of inventory so as firms increase then the order size increase, the number size orders fall, and therefore order cost declines, right? So as a firm increases, it tends to buy in more bulk, and by buying in more bulk, then it reduces the frequency which, with which orders are placed, and hence uh, the order cost, because every order would have some amount of cost associated with it, then that decreases. But on the other side, an increase in order size also means that the average inventory amount um, also increase, and so that the carrying cost of inventory rises. So it's always a challenge for you to strike a balance between order costs and inventory holding costs. So ideally, you want to strike that balance where you can uh, minimize that cost, right? For the trade-off between those two costs. Which brings into focus uh, a tool that companies use, which is called the economic order quantity. So that's the order size that minimizes total inventory costs. And when we speak about total inventory costs, we, we, we're speaking both about the holding costs and the order costs, right? So the formula for an economic order quantity is two times sales multiplied by cost per order upon the carrying costs per. Um, Per item. Can you just give me one minute, please? Right, so this is the economic the formula for the economic order quantity. Uh, so in this example, it says the demand for apples is 20,000 units per year at a steady rate. It costs $10 to place an order and 20 cents to hold an apple for a year. Find the order size to 
maximize inventory costs, the number of orders placed per year, the length of inventory cycle, and the total cost of holding inventory for the year. So if we use the formula to find the economic order quantity, it will be two times, well, the sales amount of 20,000 times the cost per order, which is $10. All that divided by 20 cents, and you should have the economic order quantity of 1,414 apples. So it says, where if you order 1,414 apples, then that would be the economic order quantity, which means that the total cost, total inventory cost will, will be the least at that point, right? If you wanna calculate the number of orders each year, it also means that the, if we use the economic, if we order at the economic order quantity, the number of orders per year would be the 20,000 apples that we expect to sell divided by 1,414 apples. And that will give us roughly 14 orders per year, right? And the inventory cycle, right? So that's the amount of time that the inventory will turn over would be roughly 52 weeks in a year divided by 14 orders. So that'd be 3.7 weeks. Or you can do it in days. So you can say three, six to five days divided by 14 orders. And that will tell you the amount of days your inventory will turn over, uh, take the turnover. And then to find the total cost, it would be the number of orders multiplied by um, the cost per order plus the average apples per order. So that will be 114, 1,414 divided by two multiplied by the, by the cost per apple. And the total cost of holding one apple per year would be $218,801, right? So that's the total cost per year. And that's just an example uh, or a tech, of an example of a technique that we can use to minimize inventory uh, inventory costs or total cost of inventory. Are there any questions? All right, so that's it for inventory. Then we look at credit management. So this is management of sales you make on credit. All right. So these are management of debtors. So there are five sets of answers that we need to attend to when we look at the management of debtors. So the first one is the credit period. So how long you would give customers to pay their bills and whether or not you, you're prepared to offer discount for prompt payment. Do you require formal uh, agreement between uh, from the buyer? or you just ask them to sign a receipt, right? So you also look at the formality of the arrangement between the buyer and you, right? So do you enter into a contract or something a little more formal or it's just uh, you delivering the goods and the signing as received? Then you need to determine, how do you, how do you determine which customers are likely to pay the bills? So you have to get systems in place that will give you an indication of those who are credit worthy. Then you have to look at credit limits. So how much credit you're willing to extend to each customer. Right. Uh, then you have to look at your appetite uh, for risk. So do you just be safe and, and uh, say no to those who are who look very doubtful? Or you just or do you in your appetite for risk act, act that there will be some debts that will go bad, right? And then finally, uh, how would you collect your money when it becomes due, right? So there should be some, some policy or way of working that you will implement uh, when money becomes due. Right? So those are some of the questions that you need to address when you look at debt management. 
terms of sale. So this is typical of North America. So terms of sale, you can have it on credit, you can have discounts, you can have payment terms um, offered in the sale. So one of the examples that you'll see typically in North America is a 2-10 net 20. And what that really means is that you'll get 2% discount for early payment. And that early payment will mean uh, the number of days that discount is available for. So it's available for 10 days. So if you pay the bill in 10 days, you can get 2% discount. But then if you don't uh, take advantage of that discount, then you're expected to pay the, the bill in 30 days, right? Uh, so when you see an example of 2-10 and 30, it really means if you pay a bill early, so that's 10 days or less, you get 2% discount. Uh, but if you don't, then you're expected to settle that bill in 30 days. You will carry out, carry out things in, in the management of debt, uh, things such as credit analysis, right? So in the credit analysis, it's a procedure that you develop, uh, which will give you an indication of whether or not a customer is likely to pay its bill and whether or not they're likely to pay its bill on time. For very big companies, uh, particularly in the US, there are credit rating agencies, one of which is Dun & Bradstreet, and they provide to businesses, oftentimes at a cost, uh, reports on the credit, credit worthiness of potential customers. In Guyana, we have an attempt that is being made by Credit Info. Uh, so that's an agency that's been around for maybe six, seven years. Uh, but they are developing a database that gives credit reports on individuals. I'm not sure if they're into companies as yet, but I know they certainly do it for individuals. And they've partnered with some banks, they've partnered with, um, with court singers, um, iPad, and a couple of um, some of the utility companies they've partnered with too. And on a yearly basis, uh, periodically, um, they can generate credit reports for you. I think now they give for every um, taxpayer a free credit report per year. So you can request that from them. Um, anything more than the one, then you pay for it. Uh, but it's just an indication of, well, it's just an attempt, sorry, to assess individuals' credit worthiness in Guyana. So it gives the banks and who, who might be uh, wanting to give, provide loan facilities, you know, an idea of how credit worthy you are, right? You can also use um, financial ratios, which can help to determine a, a customer's ability to pay their bills. So you can look at their financials and you know, run some of the analysis that you would have done in earlier classes uh, to see whether or not there is excess um, cash flows for customers to settle their bills, right? You should always have a, a credit policy, which is standard set to determine the amount and the nature of credit to extend to, to customers. So it, it, you should have policies that, for example, say for every new customer, uh, maybe the first, the first transaction is on cash. And then once that goes well, then you can say, well, we will only ex extend credit to a particular amount. Uh, we will only extend credit to customers who are in a particular industry, right? Uh, so those are some of the policy positions that you can, you can um, adopt. Added to that, you can have your own um, internal credit scoring. Right. So you might have done businesses with, or when you start to do business with a, a new customer, uh, then you can, you know, you can set up parameters, your own internal credit scoring parameters, which will give um, customers who you do repeated business, particular uh, a, a scoring system. So you know who are, who you can extend more credit to, who you can't, and part of that scoring system, you can look at the promptness of their payment, the amount that they've um, typically done business with, I mean, the value of the transactions. So those are things that you are you, you can incorporate in your credit management system, right? 
Critical to know that extending credit gives you the probability of a profit, but it's not guaranteed simply because uh, there's a chance that some customers may default and, be, and some of those debts may become bad, right? But denying credit guarantees neither profit nor a loss, right? So there must be some amount of risk that you take, uh, that you're prepared to take once you're in business by extending credit. At the end of the day, uh, whether or not you extend credit to a customer, it all boils down to uh, judgment made by managers, right? So a couple of things you should consider, um, you know, whether or not you, you're a profit maximizer um, in you extending credit, credit, you should focus on the dangerous customers. So those customers who are hard payers or those customers who are drifting into the zone of, uh, being many days behind, right? And then finally, you should not just look at the initial order, but also the chance of repeat business right? whenever you decide to make decisions um, regarding the ex extension of credit to, or the extending of credit to customers. Then you should have a collection policy decision. So you, you will see how you will escalate your collection efforts. So whether it's um, first, I know some companies send their monthly statements to their to their customers so that their customer can see how much is owed. Um, if payment is not forthcoming, then they might send them a reminder. And then they, they have this whole policy of how it escalates. Uh, maybe a lawyer's letter, then eventually if they have to take them to court um, just to get that. Some other companies and more this is Europe have a factoring policy. So what factoring allows you to do is that you can you can go to companies who which you call factor companies and they will take their accounts receivables off your books. So they will say um, periodically you can go to them and you say, well look, I have for example total receivables of $1,000, um, they can say, well, we'll take 80% of it, or will we take all, but we'll give you 80% of the monies now. So you get $800 and then they work um, and follow up with the, with the customers to collect the rest of the money, right? So that's how factoring works. Uh, essentially what it does for you as a company is that it speeds up your cash flow. Right, so you at least collect 80% of your money up um, in a very short time, so you don't have to wait until the customer pays. And then there's an arrangement, of course, because you, you will have to pay the factoring company. Uh, some, takes, some of them take maybe 5% of the total debt. So yes, you will um, you lose 5%, but you have the opportunity of using 80% of your money sooner than would have been normal. And then there's a couple of things that you should bear in mind. So cash doesn't pay interest. So if you hoard your, um, if you hoard all the monies in your bank account, especially now, um, the banks are not even, some banks are not even paying any interest. Some are paying very, very small interest, maybe less than half of a percent, right? So there's a couple of things that you can do is that you can move those excess cash into short term, um, Securities, so you can go into things like money markets, we have which have things that you, such as over well, from as um, little as overnight positions to positions that are just for a week or a month. Um, so those are investments that you can make, right? So you have overnight investments, you have a week, month, but relatively short time so that you can have the cash available when you want. But it also means that the, the cash is earning interest for you, right? You can have a sweet program. So there's a program where a lot of multinationals will say at a particular time of a month that you have to you have to repatriate to them all the excess um, cash that you have in your system, so that at any one time they would be able to know how much cash they have as a whole in a, in a particular well in a centralized um, bank account. So that's what we call a sweep program, particularly used by multinationals with with several subsidiaries. So when I worked for a particular company um, before, every quarter you had to repatriate all the excess monies that you had, right? So that so that the, that could go to Finland, so they would know how much um, you know extra cash they have, so they can 
uh, invest those money in, in, in new technologies and or several programs that they wish. Then there's concentration banking. So in concentration banking, what they do is that these companies will say, we only use one particular bank, uh, one, right? We only use one particular bank or we minimize the amount of banks that we use. So by doing that, it reduces things like um, times for transfers. Uh, they build excellent relationships with, with, with um, bank managers and bank employees. So things become a lot more easier for them. But what it does, it really, really removes the extra costs of having money in different banks. So all those interbank transfers are removed because essentially you're dealing with one bank, but several different branches, maybe even in different countries. And then there's the lock box system, which is more used in the US these days, but uh, it, it asks customers to make deposits at basically post office. So we call them PO box in Guyana, but they call them lock box in the US. So you deposits there and then the, the task of moving, moving the funds around uh, goes to the post office. So those are some of the things that you can do to improve the efficiency um, in the use of, of, of cash. Questions? All right, and I think that's it for us tonight. Good evening. Good evening. I join a bit late. Could you say what is coming for the exam on Sunday? From lectures one to nine. One to nine. It's not Sunday anymore. The class has asked that we put it off to 